Okay, man. Big up yourself, Chris, as well. Thank you, thank you for the invite. Uh, I've been watching your stuff. I'm really, really proud of what, you, what you've achieved so far, man. So, um, yeah, shout out to you, yourself, man. Um, right, yeah, where do I start? For those who don't know, I'm Dines, um, creator, foundation, um, co-founder, uh, mentor, visual artist, um, and founder of uh, an agency called uh, Studio Blup. Um, Got to rewind it, man. Just, yeah, used to, just used to love art as a, as a, as a, as a kid um just 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 always drawing always just watching like cartoons i had a uh, i had the privilege of kind of just working on um on a few kind of on my uncle's old computers had, like drawing literally pikachu pokemon like on this like old school atari uh, and that's my first exposure to like digital art i still got them like the lines are probably pixelated um and like, i just love that i love that detail you can just create like a shape and then you make it into something you print it out into this old school paper show it to your mom she's buzzing for it you know i mean you sign it you know I, I, she's got it on me now she, she's gonna frame it she's gonna frame it um and then, yeah man i went, went to uh end up going like to university i studied a thing called graphic graphic design um i didn't know there was a career in it like i just because you know just loving art anyway I did, I did i just wanted to do something didn't want to do anything academic um and then yeah man fell into uh yeah graphic design and then from then, I just thought, you know what, let me just kind of like discover what this, this game is. You know what I mean? Um, do some research, see who the idols are, see who the icons are. And the more I dug into this thing, the more I was thinking, wow, this is such a craft. This is a trade. You know what I mean? Like, like a builder, like an electrician, like a plumber. I was like, I could create something out of nothing, you know? Um, um, and then, yeah, I was like, wicked. This is, this is me from now on. This is me from now on. Uh, but then for, and throughout sort of uni, um, I got a uh, graduated with a 2-1. Uh, I was one mic off the first, and that's always like that's always killed me. That's always like stuck, stuck with me. Um, the reasons for that is uh, with me, I kind of knew when I was at university, uh, I knew that when you leave, you had to get the end result right, and you had to the end result had to come quick. You had to be on it. You had to know what's around you. You had to, you have to know what's trend, what's hot. So I was producing sketchbooks about that that big with like this is the color that's hot right now. This is the typography you need to use. And this is like the angle and the, the direction you need to go. Um, and because of that, I kind of got penalized for that because, you know, kids were submitting sketchbooks that big and I was doing that big, but they were just putting, filling it with like leaves and like just rubbish <laughs> and just random stuff, but they were putting in the work. So I kind of then realized, you know, like this, this game ain't for me. And I was like, I just got my mark to one. And I was like, right, use those design, those skills that I harness to um, start my, my career in design and do it my own way. Well, so you went straight into the studio from university. You launched immediately. Yeah, yeah. So literally um, one of my best mates, he said, basically, look, he's a little bit older than me. He went, there's no, there's no, um, there's no design like, jobs out there. It's, it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard industry. You know, you've got thousands and thousands of like students trying to wire for that one spot. Mm. And he goes, if you want to join that rat race, like, you know, you're going to be like disappointed or you can start early and build up the momentum, learn the game, learn your trade, um, start something new, start something fresh and then um, try your own thing out. So when, when I was in my second year, we had a, um, a project called the Personal Branding Project. So whilst everyone was like doing business cards for like their own name and stuff, I was like, actually, let me use this time um, to create my own company. Uh, so I've called it Studio Blup. Um, and I was just like, you know what, this is, uh, let me just use this time to kind of create that brand, that business card. Um, and I actually passed that course because I was the only one who thought bigger than like yeah. myself at the time when creating a studio was, was a thing. But now it's about personal branding, but then it wasn't a thing. Um, so yeah, so when I graduated, I was just like, okay, let me just like um, go into, um, we call it freelance, but I was just knocking on doors. Yeah. of all the clubs in Southampton, the restaurants, the small little businesses and saying like, guys, like, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm dying. This is my portfolio. Um, let me design, design you a logo or a flyer for free. Um, and we can exchange it for like either a beer or yeah. like, you know, guest list, uh, free food. You know, so I was using that as currency. Yeah. And as momentum happens, I was like, okay, cool. I'm making enough money to pay, pay for my rent, but pay for my rent, enough to make food uh, to eat. Um, enough to travel. I was like, I'm, a, I'm in a good space. I'm a good, in a good space as like a 23 year old. So that's how it, that's how it happened. Wow. Amazing. So that, that um, going back to the, uni, what the timelines, sorry, roughly the hands on that from the uni to, to, to now, was that, that's not that one. Did I then? No. Yeah. So um, it's been, to be fair, uh, so, so ooh, about 13 years. Okay. 
13 years. So that's like 13 years of like just hard, hard, hard graft. Yeah. Um, you know what? And I, to be fair, because I didn't, I, I knew it wouldn't come easy. No, it's, you know, it's had its highs and it's had its lows. When I graduated, like I said, you know, I, I was in Southampton for another four years, right? I'm from London originally. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to come back to London, my parents still live there. Am I going to be dependent on them? Am I going to actually just kind of sit there and think, okay, there's no, where's the hunger coming from? Because, you know, my mum will buy the food or, you know, I've got it easy. So I was like, okay, I need to go out there in the wild, wild world and try and survive on my own and live on my own for the first time. Um, so we've got a little, little a cute little flat in Southampton, like I think it was like 200 quid a month, shit or another one. It was an absolute shit hole. It was, it was awful. But you know what? Like the room was damp. Um, like there was mold everywhere, but like it was so cheap, but it was right in the middle of town. And I was like, okay, I need a base. Um, so because it was so, because it, it, it gave me that thick backbone, mm. I was like, okay, cool. So then I moved to, to London um, with my business partner, Alex. And um, yeah, we set up in London oh. and um, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, so, been, so those informative years, so to speak, it's starting your own business, that must have been invaluable to where you are now, sort of learning the craft, you know, like you say, building a thick skin, sort of uh, coping with rejection, the sort of the mental things that come with that, you know, the imposter syndrome, all of those things, that must have really helped. Sort of impossible, really difficult at the time, but now it must have been not sort of the thing that you need, especially coming straight out of uni, not having um, any agency work experience. That, that's it, brother. And, and um, you know, the, the whole... It's about confidence, right? So for me, you know, I, in a class of 70 people in my graphic design um, course, to be honest, like only about five of us were doing something, you know, only five of us had a specific style um, or, or basically like any goods. And it's a shame because like, you know, like as tutors, you need to like nurture that and kind of find it. But like, I think there was like a big like separation because I come from a graffiti background and an illustrator background, like I had it naturally, but there's a couple of like kids in there that just really didn't grasp what graphic design was and they, and they got left behind and it was such a shame. And looking back, you know, I wish I was there to, I mean, I helped my business partner Alex, like pass his course, but I wish I helped, you know, to, to these people develop and grow and, you know, fall into the industry as well. So for me, it was like, I always had the confidence and if I'm creating something of my own and my own style, then I wouldn't feel like I have imposter syndrome or mm. feel like I shouldn't be here because, you know, people are seeing what I'm creating and they're seeing something different. And I was very, very conscious of that from an early age. Now, when you're trying to create something the same as everyone else, you're going to be measured up against them. Mm. And if you do get to the top, people are always going to question, like, how do you do that? But like, you haven't created anything new. Mm. So it's always trying to, that was always my key to find that, that thread to feel like I belong in this industry. Yeah. Yeah, so how did, uh, was that, um, has that been an organic process then or did you have a very clear in your mind when you first started this is what we want to achieve compared to what we might see today looking at your website and your work? Yeah, yeah. Um, That's obviously uh, evolved over time. But exactly. Did you always have that in mind, you know, that long term? Did you always think this is what we, where we want to get to? Exactly that, exactly that. So, you know, uh, you know, I used to sell paintings on eBay, like graffiti art paintings on eBay. So like, I've, all, I've always been in that kind of like entrepreneur, entrepreneurial like mindset. Um, you know, I was making like 400 pound a week, just like, just selling these, these, like, these um, I used to get like uh, one pound canvases from like uh, the pound shop in Southampton, yeah. sell it on eBay um, and duplicate it like five times and like make five times as much money. You know what I mean? So like give it to the next five bidders. Um, and like, that was the kind of thing where I was, like, I, I, I was developing the craft, the homeless, the, the, the skill. Mm. Um, and then like, you know, I, like I said, I've been in it for 13 years and you've got to stay consistent. I was known for, I was known for that guy who was like the digital artist. Um, I would put together like a random, just bit of artwork for a flyer design. And, um, and it would be out in, in London or Miami or whatever. But people would know it was me. It had my fingerprint. Yeah. So as a graffiti artist, you know, I mean, illegally and, leg and legally, you know, when I used to like tag up a wall, I was leaving my print everywhere I went, you know, so with that, I was like, how do I leave my print the legitimate, legitimate way, but in a more artistic nature? Um, so to stay that constant throughout, you know, that's always been that backbone. And when you have that thread, you can kind of try new things, yeah. try things that don't work and still keep that kind of like balance mm. because that's who you really are. That's what yeah. you know. Has that come from your, your background, from your childhood, from, you know, from 
spray painting or graffiti in your neighbourhood or what you know where you where you were brought up was that part of your life like the music the culture the, you know the fashion yeah yeah so um growing up in London you know to be fair like growing up in, like in, in London was good because you know I didn't you know I wasn't into all that like naughty stuff you know I was for me I was just, my life was simple growing up you know yeah. it was just me and my best mate playing football like constantly um in the car park you know what I mean scraping up our knees yeah. um as I got a little bit older like you know other kids in our school like into like girls and drinking and smoking <laughs> like when I was interested just graffiti <laughs> graffiti and just like um like R&B and like garage music like that's all I cared about um so like for me it's just like I was discovering myself kind of thing and you know doing that and being just surrounded by um, like the culture and um, you know my dad's reggae on a, on, a, on, a, on a Sunday morning and and you know being a, like from a, from a Caribbean um, West Indian uh, background, seeing you know, talking to my uncles, you know that kind of like that culture, that love and energy was always going to be installed into me. Um, yeah. So what you see now is like a product of what was surrounding me. Yeah, and the reason I asked that because the first time I saw your work is it reminded me of Goldie. The album, the goldies, um, album covers. I remember buying Timeless when I was younger, and it, it, it folded out to this huge artwork that he had created. And it's when you read further into that, how important the, the process of what he then created music of, of, from a fashion perspective it all boils down to what you experience at the grassroots. It's always, I think, that's always really important for people to never lose that yeah, that identity. Yeah, Chris. I mean, like, I, I relate. I, I relate all my work to music. That's why. That's yeah. why I call it. That's why I call it the remix. Yeah. You know, I coined that, like, you know what I mean? Like, I called artwork remix, like, 10 years ago. Now you're seeing it everywhere, like, all the remixes. But everything I was doing was a remix. So when you're taking a one object and another and you pull it together and you're creating something, that's a remix. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of then just, like, just stuck with it. So when you're like, Goldie, yeah, Goldie was a massive influence as well, like, for me, because, like, you're seeing this guy who had his own personality, his own, like, um, style in music, and then, like, just flourish from that. So I, that's why, you know, my work can combine beautifully with music because it's come from the soul of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's really important. I think in that time, although it's present there, that was the, the emergence of having personality is not being afraid of who you are as opposed to being this generic, we've sort of gone full circle a little bit with things like X Factor and stuff where, you know, the, you, people are being pulled together. But this, that music, you know, garage and grind and all that sort of thing, it's much more about the people, isn't it? And I think that, that people, creative people, designers, artists, always still need to remember that you know we're not just uh, producers of, of logos and typography and colors and stuff but you know we, you have to put your own soul into that to make it something that people want as opposed to being an off-the-shelf thing so it's uh, i think it's important for people to keep that, that really um, at the fore of their mind moving on to to the way you're at now and where you started off say those four years in southampton what's that timeline like in between guys was there was there a series of sort of chapters in that, that that are quite memorable from where you've evolved and changed and, and gone in different directions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I started off, so I created Studio Bluff and it was just me on my own, right? Um, yeah. Because when I was trying to find out the bigger bits of work, you know, I was, I, I was ambitious, right? But when you're emailing from like a dines at gmail.com, like it, 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 it like they, you wouldn't get a, a response, right? So, so I thought, let me just hack the system and create like a studio that's, that sounds bigger than what it is. So, you know, I invested, uh, this is when like flash design was about, yeah. but I was like, look, let me just learn how to make a website quickly. Um, let me like set up an email address. Let, let me call myself we, <laughs> you know what I mean? So then like when people, when I did email and put all the work on, it felt like a company. And looking back, that's probably like a manifestation of what is happening right now. You know, I've got my team, I've got the studio in Soho. You know, I've got to work working with the world's biggest brands, like, but that's all just come from like a blag at the beginning because it's like I just needed to like pay the bills, right? Um, so it was just like momentum. So throughout like the, the different types of chapters where um the most important thing chapter was for me was um when I, I literally I was down to my last 20 quid, literally. And um, because I put everything into this, you know, I moved to London, um, you know, I moved in with a couple of my uni mates, and um, we found this like five bedroom house in, in North London. Like we were lucky because our land was a little bit, little bit fruity, a little bit dodgy. So you pay them in cash, you know what I mean? And um, and then like so everything was just like made for me there. But because um, when me and Alex moved to London, we were trying to work out how, where how do we spend our money. So everything was going outgoing, and everything was like paying bills. We had to buy food from Tesco with the yellow stickers. So we were broke. We were skint. Yeah. 
So I said to myself, you know what? Like, I need to like invest in myself. Like, if I've got twenty quid left, how do I utilize this? So what? So what happened was there's a festival called Off Festival, and it was based in Paris. And these tickets were uh, tickets for the train um, was I think US US style, like hundred fifty quid at the time. I was like, I can't afford that. But how much is a coach <laughs> from London to Paris? And I was like, okay, cool. That's twenty five quid. So put the money to put the money in and there was like a nine hour um coach drive I mean actually that's about 12 hour coach drive to, to Paris anyway so I turned up to this event luckily I blacked some tickets as well because you know I was making a name in the design scene at the time sat down and um I saw this um I saw everyone speaking but there was like my ideal idols like non-format um you had Alice Tro like, there's quite a lot, a lot of um, idols on the stage I sat next to my best mate. I said, he came with me. He had a job. Like, you know, he was doing well. I said, I'm going to be on that stage one day. And I like, and if, give me till next year. And I'm going to wait, work so hard that I'm going to be asked to be on that stage. And he went, yeah, right, whatever, mate. I was like, no, nah, trust me. But it was that moment where I was just like, okay, cool. I know, I know, now I know what I need to do to be on that stage in front of a thousand people. And as soon as I left, my head was down, created, networked, built up the portfolio. And then eventually got that email, you know, saying like, Diane's like, you know, we've been seeing your work. We'd love to love you for you to feature um, on a stage next year. And for me, that was just like, boom. One, I've been accepted into the industry. Two, I knew what I was doing. And three, like, like I visioned that I was going to be on that stage. Um, and that was my chance to like shine and tell people my philosophy and get people to believe in what I believe in. Yeah. What's that 12 months then look like in, in realistic terms? Networking was that. Uh, thrashing it out on social media, LinkedIn and stuff like that? Was that just uh, ringing people, emailing people, knocking doors just as much as you could? Yeah, yeah. Um, so at the time, you know, Instagram wasn't even a, a thing. It was brand new like then. So like it wasn't about putting your work on there. There were things like Behance. And, uh, you know, these are the days when like magazines were, um, were a thing like computer arts. Like, um, um, uh, lo those are like design magazines. So like I would make relationships with like the editors. You know, I would tweet them or I'll just find a number um, or email, just message them. And um, the most iconic thing that's happened like recently, like last year, so I, literally about 13 years ago, I've emailed a magazine called I Magazine, massive magazine, like back in the day, still is. And um, I used to read at university. And literally 13 years later, like he messaged me back, he goes, Dines, I'm so sorry, I've literally just seen your email. Uh, we would love to feature you and like, give you like a spread, like um, a team up with one of my boys called um, David Gates who wrote the, um, wrote the, the text for it. Um, and next minute I was like, in this iconic magazine that, you know, I emailed 13 years ago. Yeah. And they've just come back, but because they've seen the growth, it's like, wicked, you're, now you're ready kind of thing. But, you know, but it's, it's, it's that thing, like it's just knocking on those doors. It's, it's about exposure. It's about marketing yourself. It's about having the confidence um, so kind of like, you know, if people don't respond, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Like just keep, keep knocking, keep trying. Yeah. Um, and eventually it will come around like yeah. minded 13 years later. And that's my lucky number. If they're getting patient, if they don't respond within a day, but 13 years, I, it a bit. <laughs> that's the problem, Chris. I think like with, with fast, with fast, um, responses and, and fast, everything in life, you know, people are losing, like, has lost the will of patience. Mm. You know, it's a numbers game. You know, it's the more people you reach out to, like, you know, the, the bigger the chance is going to be right so it's about putting that work in um and being brave enough to do it like, i know i understand i understand people are scared to pick up a phone or text you know what i used to do is i like, pretend i was someone else you know i used to have a different voice in my head and like just write it quickly write it and just de detach yourself from the emotions from it yeah. when you press send it you just don't look at it again just, just press send you know what i mean don't yeah. dwell in it and move on and that's always been like my philosophy in life just 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 go in there separate yourself be brave and come out at the other side because you're going to benefit from that. Yeah, but also I think that that's a really good point in terms of the, you can joke about the, the timeline of 13 years sounds like crazy, isn't it? But however busy people are, I think most of us mentally register everything that we receive. And it's always, you know, it's always there. So it's sort of perseverance, it's consistency, it's you know, just being, um, you know, just doing your thing and, and it all, good things come to those who wait. But. That's it. So moving on to the, the studio as it is now, I'm fascinated with when I read the, the site. It's, actually, it's, it's a it's a place that I would love to be myself because I sort of um, from a, a creative perspective, and I love the line where it's um, along the lines of we're not a design studio, we're a creative studio. So, if anyone that reading that, um, can you sort of decipher that a little bit for anybody that's confused maybe between the two? 
so um so we so we decided like, like ages ago that we are not a design agency or like uh i don't know i just hate it I don't know we've never we've never we've we've never fit in because i've never looked at competition or i've never been inspired by like just branding agencies and stuff like that like mm. we're, we're we are an ideas and creative house right so it's you know how do you take your like your style or like your philosophy and design philosophies and apply it to you know different brands do you like um launch it on product do you make your own product do you design massive screens for a big festival uh do you collaborate with like with the world's biggest brands but like with your own kind of philosophy so to to kind of call it a creative agency or creative house gives us a lot more freedom to express ourselves and not pigeonhole ourselves you know and if there's a bit of work that we can't do or like you know it's a bit out um you know a bit past us the whole beauty of this is I, I can bring in other people. I can bring in other talent, other creatives. You know, I've, I've built up an amazing team at Studio Block where, you know, we've got different personalities, different philosophies, different um, just like fire in their belly, like to achieve and to get to the top. So for us, it's like that creative house is literally, we are in a creative house. Yeah. And Chris, you know, people, you know, always say you know oh, i would love to like work at, work at studio bluff and stuff like that and you know i created that space so people want to come and want to love to work for us and and not be pigeonholed by like that, that big agency kind of philosophy where you're just a number in a business yeah. you know i see people being heartbroken and, and good designers fall at the wayside because they're in this big this big big massive agency and they've lost their identity and the time they finished, they've been left behind because they haven't been allowed to grow themselves because they thought, you know, an ad agency was the way the way to go. Yeah. So the most important thing was, if you're looking for a company to work for, make sure it aligns with your values and where you want to be. And um, and and if and if it doesn't, if you go into that company, just make sure you can actually um, change the way they operate as well, so it becomes your place of worship. Yeah. Did you find that difficult to to find that space where you're at now? Because I I learned from my background as a uh, graphic designer originally in, moving into different disciplines and ended up being a branding designer. But the industry in its nature seems to be outside of maybe the bigger hubs. It's, it's quite sort of traditional and a bit sort of old fashioned. You know, you, you're, you're a graphic designer, you just sort of sit in front of a screen and work on a uh, sort of print based or digital based, but you don't really ever do much more with the client a lot of the times. You know, you don't get to dive into many other areas. And it seems from the outside, when I look at your site, it's not, it, it it really encompasses so much. It's like you could be sort of involved in a, a fashion show or you could be involved in a launch of a, a music video or you, know, you could be doing big events and talking about the sort of culture that you've developed. Is that a hard place to find originally or did that just come quite naturally? Yeah, so on, on your original point, Chris, um, as well, the first thing that you actually did say is that people need jobs, right? People need to do sit behind a Mac and churn out stuff for clients. Like there is nothing wrong with that. Um, but if it's not what you want to do, you've, you've still got from 6 p.m. to like 12 at night to do your own shit, <laughs> you know what I mean? And create the reality um, that you want to create and be in, right? So like I said, you know, being in this game for so long, just creating and being consistent has allowed me to work on the ideal client list and projects that I want to create because I wasn't just working, putting all my energy into someone else's vision or stuff to, just to pay the bills. I was, I was taking that risk at night and going to bed at 4 a.m., creating my own world mm. so when you look at the stuff that we're producing there are stuff there's loads of stuff that you don't see on the site you know there's there is branding work you know there is um photography film like all that stuff um but the reason why everything that you're seeing currently is because we've put ourselves in that position so when they knock on the door they say you know, we, we love what, what you want to do can you work help work work with us on a brief um, because they see your portfolio as a, as a place of insp inspiration and a place to pick ideas from. And the best thing is when they create like a mood board to brief you, it's just full of your work. So mm -hmm. they're basically saying, oh, that concept that you've done on Instagram, uh, we want it like this, um, um, fixed with a little bit of that. You know, mm -hmm. So you're kind of force feeding them ideas already, but that's when you have to put the work in. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and uh, funny if you mentioned, uh, when we went right to the start, you talked about... Uh, cartoons and sketching and you mentioned Pikachu in there and uh, some of those files that you sent me I I've, I've, no, I've noticed a certain character in that those files is that again is that something that you sort of subconsciously you know draw upon the past do you think and it's it's just a, a memory bank that you just gradually built up over time I mean like growing up watching cartoons is like that's my place of joy happiness you know 
when I meditate, I try and create that, 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 that moment of silence, that calm. But when I'm, uh, if I can rewire my brain back to like that childhood happiness and be in a good place whilst designing and feeling happy when I'm designing, I'll chuck in a little Pikachu or I'll chuck in a little bit of a like Mario, you know what I mean? Like the Disney remixes that we like, we were known for, like known for. Um, because like, I want to evoke that emotion that I have to like the people seeing it through the screen as well. And when I'm remixing or like merging the different kind of like cultural icons and the, you know, the retro vibe, it stimulates that kind of joy, that smile, that happiness, um, that bit of dying in, goes into you, you know, um, and, you know, you look at it and, you know, they, they, they're like, whoa, this is, this is, this is a nice little feeling. Um, look, you know, we're, we're in talks with like a few um, license and license and deals um, to kind of bring this stuff to reality. You know, at the moment, you know, it's very like tricky lines using characters without being, without being licensed. But at the same time, you know, it's just like, it's art. So how can you punish someone from using a, ca a cartoon character when they're trying to just create art? You know, that's what the point of art is, right? Um, so yeah, so we're, there's a few things coming up, but yeah, Pikachu is my boy. Yeah, so I mean, that, but that must be really interesting for, from a client's perspective as well. Is that I think sometimes design and branding can be can become really serious, and, and it, I think more than ever, some of the guys that we've spoken to recently, like Kota and Ragged Apes, they seem to have been introducing a lot more. Uh, the language that they use, the sort of you know the playfulness, the energy, sort of maybe sort of trying to rip up some of those, especially for startup businesses, sort of maybe. And I see that in your work as well. You know, it's a different style, but there's definitely much more of a, a fluid, sort of um, immersive nature to it. Yeah, I think that, um, so. The work that we created, um, you know, when I was like just creating all these remixes, it's about how do we get attention? How do we stop that scroll? You know, um, I'll produce a bright yellow piece, you know, and it's like, oh, that stops it, you want it, and you're going to like it, you're going to engage in it, right? You hashtag it the right way, it's going to spread your, your, your message, right? So I remember when, like, Game of Thrones was, like, hot, you know, and I would just remix the Game of Thrones, like, character. Um, and that would have a huge engagement because people were just talking about this last episode of Game of Thrones. So I was like, wicked, I want to be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, when Marcus Bashford was, like, um, you know, came out about, you know, feeding the kids, you know, we did a remix of that. Put it on our on our um, our news our, our news blog, um, and that got massive engagement because we're creating visual language that people are talking about. Yeah. And within that within that piece, you know, we want to tell a story. We want to get people excited. We want to get people to know what you know what we're understanding. So when you're creating that as artwork, as well as a story to be told, or you can look deeper into it and find different elements. That's almost like a micro movie, but in in a, in a, in a, in a still life. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that ties in really well with your um, the, the, on your site where you've got about living the culture. So that's you know that's sort of being quite reactive, I suppose, isn't it? It's being part of the team, are, are, are deep in that, that culture, that, that day to day. That sort of we were speaking just before this about what happened after the football, weren't we? It's about yeah. being reactive, isn't it? It's about being you know your brands can have trust in you because you are you you are part of the day to day. Yeah, and you know. So it's, we live the culture, learn the culture, and we deliver for the culture. Um, and it's being authentic to what you create, being the go-to like guy to know what's happening in, in the world, right? So before COVID, when everyone was out and, you know, I was on stage with like, say, Stormzy, Skepta, you know, these are relationships I've built through just like um, uh, years of just like knowing people in the grime scene, you know, and next minute you're on the stage with them in front of like, you know, 15,000 people, like, and, this is, and you're thinking this is mental. But the thing is, it's like, not you're not being selfish you're um, what i was doing is like okay i'm enjoying the artist but i'm looking more at the crowd i'm seeing how they're reacting to the stars i'm seeing how what they were doing what they're wearing and taking that raw data to then feed back into the work so when we do when we do produce work for that crowd it's authentic because we've been there we understand it um and you know that's my joy that's my passion to to to, to be part of culture to understand the latest trends to understand what the latest music the latest fashion because that just that just feeds into that the creative process mm -hmm. so when you have a brand knocking on the door and they're saying um you know we want to speak to this, this audience like can you help us we know through just just raw data and our fan base and where we are that we can create something that will appeal to that whole um, audience yeah so does that appeal to brands of of all sorts or do you generally find that you track brands that are part of the scene and the cultures that you already have or do you have ones that's wanting to step into that and, and yeah, yeah. So, for example, just just finished working with like a massive US car brand called Genesis. Like, literally, just reached out to me on Instagram, 
Yeah. Um, and so like Diane, you're like, you know, um, we've seen what you're doing and you know, um, you know, but they're based in America and they were like, we want to attract the, the London audience. You know, we want London to know what the Genesis car is. You check it out on our Instagram, go on their, their page. And it's like, um, that was a, like the first time like an overseas company have used us as influencers to create art and to create a campaign that will turn eyes back onto their car brand to make it relevant and cool. Now, I understand the value in that. So I put a value on that. I said, if you want us, if you want to speak to my audience, my fan base, um, and the, the culture that we've built, this, this comes at a premium, right? This comes at not just about the money, this comes at, you got to understand that this, your company that we're going to be shouting about ticks the right boxes for us. Are you ethical? What's the background? Um, are you um, doing good things? How are you helping your community? These are the things that we need to know first before we attach our brand onto a brand. And when they tick those boxes, I was like, boom, this is the perfect collaboration because it came 360. So then you're ultimately, you've become, the studio's become a brand in its own right then, as opposed to just the business that serves other businesses. You've become the, the, the voice of other people behind you. That's really, Absolutely. that's a very interesting sort of place to be and surely that must be really exciting. Yeah, Chris, like, you, know, you know, we were tired like for the past, I mean, this has only really happened past like two, two years. But we were tired of chasing, we we're tired of pitching, like yeah. we're like, going up big agencies and like big agencies will steal our work. And next thing you see an exactly what you pitched to this company. And it it, it, it pissed me off because like so it's, it annoyed me because like you put all your heart and work and soul into it and you're creating something that you think what they want. And I said, I just said to Alex, we need to change game now. We need to like understand that we want brands to come to us. Uh, we want brands to be proud that Studio Blood are working with them in collaboration. We want them to shout and say, like, we've got these guys working with us. So how do you do that? So when you start proposing ideas to the brand, um, that's when they're like, I love this idea. And we're then saying, yeah, we're also going to be attaching us, our name to it. So we create like the, the, almost like the perfect collaboration throughout. Mm -hmm. And that way you're not chasing work. You're putting ideas to them. And when you do that, then you're not sitting back and waiting. You're, you're always innovating. You're always staying hunger. In, in, in reality's terms, how does that work, Don, on a, on a, when you first started that concept? Did you just connect with businesses and say, we think this would work for you? Or did, was it just a moment in time when someone asked you for your opinion and it, it just went from there? Yeah, it, it, look, it's, it's a long process, right? So you can't just do it and just email random somewhere ideas. You've got to gain that trust. So the, luckily, like the clients that we've worked with, um, you know, throughout, I, I know the people at the top, right? So I'm brainstorming with them, right? Um, and when you're brainstorming with like these people that are making the decisions, it allows you like that kind of creative freedom, but that comes over time, that comes over trust, that comes over like building and um, developing good work, right? So when like, a company comes out of the blue, they've seen what you've done for like a brand or they, they know someone that's recommended you, right? But like I said before, to unlock those bits of work, you have to do conceptual work. You have to do stuff that is outside the brief and showcase it on your own platform. So then when they see it, they can trust you to do what they ask you to do and it might stimulate another idea. So it works both ways, you know, the trust and this also also about the commitment of what you want to do. And it's incredible doing these talks. How many, even like the agencies that are perceived to be at the top of their game, how many of them still do self-initiated work, spend the dedicate the time, put the team on it and create things just to showcase what they're what they're capable of because a lot of the briefed work can be quite restrictive so again i suppose that's really important for you guys because it is so at times looks so quite experimental and you've got to you know, there seems to be a lot of layers and elements in a lot of your work that you must take a long time to develop yeah i mean with with um you know we call it feeding the beast right so um in all, in all, in all honesty you know it's 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 coming from my brain right so i'm feeding it down to sort of my my team as well so I'm saying to them, you know, I want to give my team like the confidence like to create and come to me with like tech ideas or whatever. Um, and then we brainstorm that together. And it's like, okay, this is this is where we want to go kind of thing. Um, and because, you know, sometimes I'm a, I'm a lone island, right? You know, so instead of just watching TV, I'm just creating. I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking of new ideas. You know, that's me just like being happy. The, the business can come second. I don't like, I don't care about <laughs> the business, about me fulfilling what I want to be proud of. So when I have that hunger and then I'm then going in on a, on, a, on a Monday, like on a Zoom call to the team and um, whatever, or individually speaking about my designers, they're buzzing because I've got that energy of like showing them something new that inspires them to create something new, you know, and it keeps everyone hungry, keeps everyone just aware of it as well. So 
that's my joy because it's, it's 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 what that's the only thing I can do. So I nurture that and enjoy it. Yeah, and keeping it fresh is really important, isn't it? Because it's so easy to get a bit stale or get bogged down in the paperwork and the business sort of side of things. Those things need to be taken care of, but they're not really for anybody else's um, eyes but yours. So it's it's important to have that continually refresh your mind with you know new culture and like you say, what your the whole ethos of what Plop is about. You know, is that being in that inside of the bubble as opposed to looking. From the outside in so it's you know you, i suppose and the motivation lies at your door doesn't it you have to keep people when you've got a team keep them going that's it you know and luckily i've got um alex you know who's always did the opposite to me so you know he would do he would have to do the paperwork and the accounts and you know the contracts and stuff like that um which he understood from like day one when, when i asked him to be a business partner you know i was just like i, I can't do this because i don't I, I don't i don't enjoy this like i don't i, I just want to create and he's allowed me to have that freedom and at the same time, you know, to we can pay the bills and we can grow. And, you know, it's um it's 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 a beautiful partnership, you know. And I know it's hard to everyone's like, I need to find my Alex, you know, I need to find my my business partner. Everyone does, you know, and but the thing is now what you can do is there's so many people that you can co collaborate collaborate with, you can still get the same energy what I'm getting for Alex, but you can get it with multiple people. So it's just finding people in your space and people that you can collaborate with um, online to really make you achieve, you know, what you want to achieve. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I suppose this might be quite a difficult question, but from a, an average project perspective, if there is one, how does that work you know, from your, you know, from the, the inception of the, the, the partnership or the relationship with the brand to, you know, let's say an average brief where, you know, there's a certain time restrictions you put on that, is it you don't allocate certain steps and procedures that you put in place before you then start to deliver and you know work that through with the client is that is it possible to put that into a rough you know average sort of idea of how that works just for people that tune in to sort of get an understanding of you know the working processes behind projects yeah i mean i, listen, I used to get like probably like absolutely ripped for like just giving the end product like, like university i always just knew what the end result was going to be <laughs> and um because like i said i'm doing it all in my head anyway so i know what the process is and i was brief mm -hmm. here but we understood like literally after a while that there's value in like the research, right? And there's a value in like the ideation like steps. So yeah. you're sitting down with a client um, and you re-write re, re the brief with them. Um, and then you sit them down, understand the process and you say like, okay, this is what I think could work. So when you got that, then you confirm that as a, like a, a, a scope of work. And you say like, okay, after this conversation, we've, we, we can deliver this, that, 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 this, how much it costs. We set the deadlines of it. And then we start um, creating. When we start creating, we give the first draft back and we make sure it's clear. We say like, this is the first like draft. So this is this is the first stepping stone, right? Of you to, to build from. You know, most of the times they're like, oh, this is great. You know, can we just change a few um, um, bits around? Because you've listened to what they want. Like you've asked them the right questions. Yeah. So when you ask the right questions, you know what to deliver. It's when you don't listen, you're going to be on an endless loop of just trying, and trying, and trying, because you're not, you're not swallowing your ego to understand what the client needs um so make it feel like they are part of your process mm -hmm. they've come to you you give your opinion if you're going to be like that and just constantly just friction it's not going to work make them come into your world make it feel like their idea as well you know and the process is a lot more smoother so then when they when the brief is delivered that person who's commissioned you they're going to get a pay rise or a promotion because it was yeah. them who found you Right. And they're just going to commission you for the next bit of work. Right. So, like I said, you, you bring them into your world, make them feel part of your, 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 your creative process. Yeah. And then you're just going to benefit from it straight away. Yeah. I think there's, a, there's two key points there that I fully agree with in terms of you know, that, that listening to what they want and, and working. And it's a, ultimately a collaboration. You know, we, I think we use the word collaboration with other creatives because it's become this sort of cool word that is uh, used by big brands, isn't it? By quite easily just thrown online all the time. I think you have to, you know, have to build that because you want it to be a long-term relationship. You know, ultimately, if they keep on commissioning you, that's you know, it's good for the bank balance, isn't it? Um, but also that idea of research and um, being fully transparent. I think that's so important because my experiences of, of working in my early days is very much a case of we just got a brief. We didn't even question it. We would give it to a junior. They sat in front of a computer and then you did about a thousand amends because it was never right because you never knew what they wanted. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it's, um, it's really important to have that that clear idea so you know is that something that you do on every, you know is that quite a, a set sort of process that you guys have developed that runs through all projects yeah yeah so it's, it's it's so important to have like a briefing form so we've developed this little like 
five square thing where it's just like really easy for the client to be like, what's the messaging? What's the direction? What's your inspiration? Attach five images that you think, you know, that you do, that you've seen that you like the look of. You know, they, they like that, you know, even if you can't do it face to face, you get that back and you can kind of see, see where, um, oops, sorry, my alarm's just gone off. Um, you can see like where, you know, they want to go. So you can kind of like fill in the gaps and that's through experience. But actually, you know what, if, if, if you're new to the game, you know, just really, they'll be inquisitive. Like, don't be afraid to ask the questions. You know, don't be afraid to call them or email them at like 11 o'clock at night so they pick up in the morning to say, you know, um, um, you know, what was that question that you asked? Or like, does this work kind of thing? Always just just don't be afraid to ask. And when you have that, then it's just a really easy process. Yeah, and I think that, that that's that's one of those things that before you learn that, or before you're able to do that, you probably think that you're overstepping the mark. But from my experience, the clients really appreciate that because it's, you know, you're sort of avoiding extra time wasted, basically. And then time for, for clients is usually money, isn't it? So it's, you know, it's a, it's a good place to be. I think. So, yeah, that's brilliant. I just noticed the timelines again. This is uh, ridiculous how quickly these things are going. Oh, mate, it's, you can back on. I'm, 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 I'm fine, but I know people. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, no. I think more than anything, I, I just want to know what, really what you think about the future of the agency and the industry. I'm really interested to that, and it's a very big question. I know it's, it's really just an opinion more than a factual thing. But where you think like the where you think you guys will be headed, and it's you know if it's following the same path, or if you're looking at new sort of forms of technology or, or, or you know different ways of working, and the industry as a whole, because it's sort of quite fascinating at the minute where there's seems to be because of COVID, it seems to be a bit of a silver lining that. There's a lot of people more than I've ever noticed coming together to look inwards and support one another and, and the, you know, the future of the industry. Mm. But there's also this oversaturation of just sort of maybe chest beating and you know, ego driven sort of uh, elitist sort of nature to it as well. But really, from your perspective, I'll just be really interested to see from those two points you know, where you guys are going or what you think. Yeah, I think the, the small guys are going to start winning. Um, you're looking at the small, small agencies I've like the brands are being are waking up now. I think um, where you've got the big, big corporations just stealing ideas from the little guys. They're going on Instagram, using it as their mood board and putting it on as their own. Um, and it needs to stop because you know it. This is where this is where progression is going to be. Um, this is where the floor progression is. So use that use that as like fire in the belly to be like okay like if a big agency is stealing my work and they're presenting it in front of these clients and they're not commissioning me this is like how do i shine so bright that the brand comes straight to me mm -hmm. yeah, and that's that's for me was like always my philosophy you know it's happened to us too many times that you know i'm numb to it yeah because you're setting the trend so the industry and the big the big guys you know they're dying breed and it's about the individual creators now going in there expressing their personalities to help um, brands um, flourish, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at like, um, you know, stuff like the NF like NFTs that's happening, right? That's been so oversaturated because you're just getting everyone trying to release NFT and, and creatives aren't making the money now because, you know, it's the value of it is gone. So actually, how do you find different um, industries that you can fall into to help like, you know, input your design philosophies on into, right? So the future of the industry for, for me is about just like those who are brave, those who are making the noise are the ones that are going to survive. Um, if you're not, you're just going to be like going along with, with everyone else. Um, and the way to change that is, like I said, is just to be like confident in yourself and always digging and being patient um, and understanding that this is, you know, the end goal in the next 10 years where I want to be. This is what I'm going to work towards it and not worry about like, anything getting in your way and I think that's what that's the philosophy I think small businesses need to have um creatives freelancers anyone in that creative industry needs to have just to survive in this game yeah no, it's, that's a good point because I like the more I think about your work and what you've said it makes me more think like you you're on that model of a, a traditional artist would have been a hundred years ago where it's you know it's just a, it's design driven it's made by technology is you know probably doing adobe and all the rest of it you know the traditional sort of um, packages and software but it's sort of treated like a complete unique art form in its own you know, and that's a really interesting space i never really thought about it like that because it's quite easy just to get brands of certain natures sort of just want you to they're quite scared i think of anything outside of what they know you know like the, the commercial sort of boundaries that they put themselves in 
and really that the idea that we can become completely unique graphical artists, so to speak, um, and, and we sell ourselves, well not sell ourselves, but we position ourselves in that space that clients might look at a list of 50 of different people, different genres, but they just find the ones that work for that. That's quite that's an interesting it. space to be. Amen, Chris, that's it. And you know, it's, um... You don't have to be a digital artist like, like me. You know, it's, you could be a, a thinker. You could be um, that creative director that's pulling in ideas. You know, you can be um, a typographer. You know, as long as you had just believe in your craft so much that that becomes your thing, then you know you are becoming that 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 asset to anyone to any brand because it's the way you're leveling up, the way you're developing. Um, and then yeah, when you have like I said, keep us keep on saying when you have the end goal or if you're on that path there, you know that's your currency. That's your thing, like so nurture it, enjoy it. You know what I mean? That should be your thing that you're doing every, every, every day when you're sitting there in front of the front of the TV. You should be just thinking about your craft. Yeah. And one last point, Don, is that if you did you think it was really critical to put yourself? I hate the idea of a personal branding thing. So sort of this I sort of detest the idea of it, but I understand it. But do you think that was really important? Like when I when we first connected, I think the first thing that popped up was it was quite an identity of your own, you know, unlike a LinkedIn page, which was just sort of like a, another person it was you were pretty much a, a sort of you were a, a, the brand and the studio sort of when i saw it it sort of came secondary is it important to, did you think that's what catapulted you even more forward because you were really recognizable because you put yourself in that space yeah i, I think i think i needed to play the game you know um as a graffiti artist i, I used to write dines right yeah. um so i've always had that that brand that alias like people just just knew me as that creative guy dines right and it's just it's, it's the brand um, and then like, you know, when I could afford it, I trademarked the name, right? Yeah. Um, so then it, protect, it protects it, you know? And it's just like, that's the thing that gave me the confidence to be like, okay, cool. I need to be that, um, that person that can provide inspiration. You know, I need to find, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't have anyone that looked like me being a creative director or a digital artist. So I had to make it up as I go along. So if I'm going to be taking all those bullets through the industry and, you know, making those sacrifices for other people to, um, to follow in my slip, slip stream, then so be it. You know, so and to become a the, the, a personal brand, it needed to be done um, to help push a message further. You know, my I, my original brand it was blood, and I've just kind of like you know I've created that baby. I've created that studio. You know, now it's just like okay, Dines is part of blood. You know, Alice is part of blood, and that you know, um, you know, you're creating different identities for for the thing. But at the same time as well, having a personal brand really helps because you know people then know who you are um you know I'm, I'm probably the most private person private public person you know so like you go on my gram like there's not much like there but then like you know I'm showing the, the stuff that I know my audience want to see and get inspired by you know but at the same time keeping it close to my chest you know um and it's authentic it's real when you go when you start digging and you see people trying to create a brand it's fake it's all it's not authentic and that's when you're just gonna sort of drift away and not be interested so it's all about authenticity and being real to yourself and not showing off right that's a razor that's a great place to end it i think mate um oh, okay. that, anybody that hasn't checked you out yet where can they um where's the best place to find you, know, you online and on socials yeah man for the latest check out um uh, at studio underscore underscore blup um or underscore dines for the latest um and yeah just keep on a uh, visit the theblup.com as well for all our latest news and um, blog that we just launched. It's incredible. Um, we've got so much going on, man. So yeah, just check it out. You've got, you got product retail as well, haven't you? I noticed recently you've got um, you know, uh, merch and stuff available as well. So that, that's yeah, what, yeah. you can all access that via the, the main Instagram page. Can't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the, I've got, got a new drop coming as well. It's a, it's a 48 hour drops. So um, we sign up to the newsletter, you'll know when that's be first. There's some very, very exclusive t shirts going and coming up as well. I, I, need, a, I need a fire extinguisher, mate. So it's a. Uh, <laughs> there you go. That's 